Hi, this is Trisha. Welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to talk about a very touchy subject. So this is a trigger warning. So if you are triggered or upset or bothered by talks of suicide, then you might want to click out now. If you are not, then you will want to continue to watch this video. Hi, this is Trisha. Welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to talk about suicidal thoughts and the night that I wanted to take my life. Let me start off by saying that I am not a person who normally has, there's a fly, <laughs> I'm not a person who normally has suicidal thoughts. Um, I enjoy life too much. However, the pain got to be so bad that death seemed better than living. So if you um, have been with my channel for some time, then you know that I have been battling pain, chronic pain. Um, but it had gone undiagnosed for five months. Um, I actually talk about it in a previous video. It will be linked here um, and you can watch that and it'll give you an insight of what led up till this time. So starting right off, um, the month of June was miserable for me. Um, I'd have good days and then I'd have bad days, but more bad than good. Um, it got to be so bad that literally, like I could not use my hands. I was practically dragging my body behind me because I could not sustain the weight on my knees. So start from the beginning. Um, I had a appointment um, for June to, well, my doctor, my, let me start off. I'm sorry. I'm trying to talk about too many things at one time. First, let me talk about my primary care. She's awesome. I have a new one. Great. She got in. She did the work. She ordered the blood test. She did everything that the old primary care did not do. Him being a male. No offense to the men, but hey, sometimes y'all are clueless. But anywho, um, so like I said, um, I had she I had an appointment. She ordered all of the blood work. Now, the funny thing is, up until this whole point, I had been told that the only one who could diagnose me with rheumatoid arthritis was a rheumatologist. Um, and so that's why my diagnosis was chronic pain, chronic inflammatory pain, actually. Um, however, that turned out to not be true because guess what? My primary care doctor ordered the blood work to determine whether or not I had RA. So she ordered blood work, everything came back, my kidneys were in distress, um, I had a raging, in well not a raging infection, that's probably an exaggeration, but I had an infection and my blood test showed that I do have RA. So now that is my official diagnosis. Um, so that was a Wednesday. Um, I want to say that was the 13th of June. So I came home. Of course, I was distressed. I was upset. I was like, my God, not another diagnosis. I mean, on top of everything else I'm dealing with, now I have to deal with arthritis and, you know, I mean, I have arthritis in my knee, but at the same time, rheumatoid arthritis, that's, you know, that's a deterioration that, you know, I've seen people with rheumatoid arthritis, their hands are all crinkly. And, you know, I just, I, I just had these horrible images of what, you know, my body would look like now. And so, of course, I was depressed. 
Um, and I was angry and I was hurt and I was bothered and I was everything that you think you can be following, you know, an official diagnosis. So that was so Thursday, um, like any day, I guess, you know, it was pain and I was in bed and I just was frustrated and I was angry and oh my goodness. And so Thursday is kind of when the flare up happened. And so at that point, my body became inflamed. Um, I was swollen. I, my fingers were locked up. My knees hurt so bad. I mean, just literally a pain radiated through my body. There was pain. There was um, burning. There was itching. Oh my God. It was just horrible. So I made it through Thursday. However, Friday is when things took a turn. I woke up in so much pain on Friday till at some point I literally started to feel delirious because my body hurt beyond anything. I, I mean, I know I talked about being in pain before. Well, this was the tsunami of pain. Not ever, ever in my life had I ever experienced um, that level, that intensity, that literally earth shaking pain. And so by mid after, well, by early evening, I thought I can't do this anymore. This is going to drive me crazy. I got up Friday morning. I called, I had called my doctor. I had called the uh, pain doctor. I had called the emergency room. I had called everybody I could think of trying to get some kind of resolution. Like, what can I do? What, you know, what can be done? However, unfortunately, both pain and primary did not call me back until almost close of business. And, you know, they kept saying, well, if you can just hang on till Monday, I thought, I'm not going to make it till Monday. I'm not. And so I was just laying in bed. I had just came back from the bathroom. I was in excruciating pain and I just was crying. I just kept, I just cried. All I did really on Friday was call doctors, cry and beg for relief. Like I just prayed so hard for the pain to go away. Um, and like I said, I was almost to the point of delirium. Like I just could not function. So I, at some point, called my son's girlfriend and I said, look, I am in so much pain. If we don't figure something out, I am going to take this entire bottle of Norco because this has to be better. That has to be better than this. And so she was like, wait, hold on now because, you know, you're threatening. I said, I'm not threatening. I am serious. If something doesn't happen, I'm going to take these pills. She said, well, I just got off work. I'm across town. Don't do anything. I'm on my way. So I think it was about maybe 45 minutes. She got here and she came in and she was like, what can I do for you? What, you know? And I was like, I don't know. I just, the pain, I'm like, the, the Norco is not working. Um, and I just, I'm in so much pain. And unfortunately here in Nevada, I'm, I don't know how it works in other states, but here in Nevada, once you sign a contract with a doctor in terms of pain, you cannot, no one else can give you any pain medication. And so since I was under a pain doctor's contract, that meant my own primary care doctor, the ER, no one could give me pain meds. So I had already experienced going to the ER and then basically sending me home talk and telling me to call my, you know, my pain doctor in the morning, basically. Um, so I, you know, we were at our, we, I was, we were kind of not sure what to do. So at that point we, I had three prescriptions, but, uh, cause remember I mentioned that I did have an infection. So my doctor had given me some penicillin, 
Um, and we thought maybe that might have something to do with why I was in so much pain. And then she gave me two other prescriptions. So my son's girlfriend went and got those prescriptions filled. She came home. I took those thinking maybe if we could just start on the, the, the antibiotic, that maybe that would help. So unfortunately, she does work out of town. So on this particular day, she had to go home and pack. So she told me, I called your son, you know, she called my son and then said, you know, based, he was on his way. She was like, are you going to be okay? And I said, I think so. I, you know, at this point, I really don't know. So now I was worried, scared, concerned. So I had, um, we took all of the pain, the bottle, the pain bottles, I mean, the bottles of medicine out of my room and put them in my son's room. And so we thought, okay, that, you know, that should be great. So at, at maybe, at maybe about 20 to 30 minutes after she left, my son came home. He's like, mom, I, I don't know what to do. Like I, we don't, you know, and I'm like, son, I don't know either, but we're going to have to figure out something to do with this pain. I'm like, I've taken four Norco. Um, they're only five milligram, but at the same time, that's 20 milligrams of Norco, of, you know, of a narcotic. Um, and it didn't even touch the pain. In fact, those four Norco may have well may as well been a baby aspirin because that's for all the good it did for the amount of pain that I was in. Um, the only thing those Norco managed to do was to allow me to sleep for a couple of hours. So at some point, my son had already had plans for him, to take him and the, his daughters because they're here with us for the summer out for the night. Um, and he said, well, mom, are you going to be okay? And I said, yeah, you know, don't, don't disrupt the girls, take them, go do what you're going to do. Um, and I, you know, I should be fine. He was like, well, I don't, you know, really want to leave you. And I was like, you know, don't, the girls were probably looking forward to this all day. Don't, you know, go ahead and take them. I'll be fine. So unfortunately the youngest kind of got into trouble. So she wound up having to stay at home. So I wasn't home by myself, but I was home with an eight year old. Um, and so, like I said, the, the Norco did uh, manage to allow me to sleep a little bit. So I was asleep. I heard my son came, come in. He came in, he checked on me. Um, of course I was still in pain at that point. The Norco didn't take the pain away, but it made me groggy. So I kept falling asleep for the most part. Um, but I would sleep in spurts because the pain would be so bad. I'd maybe sleep 20 minutes, 30 minutes. I think I got a good hour in at one point. Um, and so I managed to doze off again. Um, I believe now it was my son got home probably around midnight or so I don't really know time was just starting to like run together. So I'm not really sure the time, but I do know that I, at some point I got up, I believe it was maybe around three o'clock to go to the bathroom and I just burst into tears because I knew once I stood up, um, it was going to hurt. It was already hurting, but I knew that once I stood up, it was going to hurt even worse. So I know I didn't want to further, you know, humiliate myself in the sense of laying there peeing in the bed so I got up as best I could drug myself to the bathroom you know use the bathroom I could not wipe myself so basically it was just I was just going to the bathroom and so I managed to get my um underwear up and drug myself back to the back to the room crying literally crying in tears all the way and so I was sitting I got ready to get back in bed and I noticed the bottle of over-the-counter sleeping pills that somehow we had missed. And I looked at that bottle and I thought, if I just take these pills, then this won't hurt anymore. I was sitting there with the pills and my water <clears throat> and my granddaughter she's 12 she went to the bathroom my door was open so I saw her 
go to the bathroom. And I knew literally in that moment, I could not do that to her. And you know, I always said I wanted to leave a legacy. That was not the legacy that I wanted to leave. So I put the water down, I put the pills down, and I called the suicide hotline. And I said, look, I am in so much pain that I am considering taking these pills. I think, though, at some point, I, re I think I realized I just needed somebody to take my mind off, somebody to talk to. To just take my mind off of wanting to take the pills because that was a battle. I didn't want to do that to my grandbaby, but at the same time, I didn't want to hurt anymore. So the struggle was hard. So she talked and we talked and we talked and she, you know, she told me, you know, you're doing good. You did your, you, you know, you clearly, you know, your family is important to you. You know, clearly you sound like someone who, you know, wants to live you know you used your coping skills you reached out this you know and this you're telling me this is the second time that you reached out um and so i'm like yeah you know normally i'm not this way but i can't take this pain i'm like right now i'm going on almost 36 hours of no sleep 36 hours straight of pain i had been in pain non-stop for almost three days the pain started on thursday it was now saturday and i there was there was never a relief there was never a let up there was never a break there was never a nothing it just was hurt i just hurt my entire body hurt i had not been able to take a bath I could barely go to the bathroom. I had not been able to wipe myself. I was looking around my room. I hadn't been able to clean my room in a month. That pain robbed me of my life. It was robbing me of my sanity. And I just could not take it anymore. I couldn't. And so I talked to her. I'm not even sure how long, but at some point my son woke up, he came into the room, he says, mom, you know, what's going on? And I said, I am on the phone with the suicide hotline. And so I said, my son just, my son just came into my room. She said, do you want me to talk to him? And I said, yes. And I handed her the phone and I just cried. All I could do was cry because I thought, this has to stop. I can't. I can't. I don't want to. I don't want to burden my. I don't want to burden my kids. I don't want to be an invalid. I don't want to become somebody who. Ha I. That was my job. That's my profession. That's what I did. I took care of people in those positions. So I know what life looks like as somebody who needs somebody to take care of them every single day. Not just take care of them, but feed them, dress them, bathe them, comb their hair, just do the stuff that we as individuals take for granted. I don't want to live like that. I never want to be able, I never want to put my children in that position. I know that they would take care of me, but at the same time, I don't want them to have to do that. Um, so at some point, my son had stepped out of the room, so at some point he comes back in. He says, okay, mom, well, the police and the paramedics are on their way. And I was like, okay, so, okay. So then I thought, okay, well, since everybody's coming, you know, we might as well get the paperwork from the doctors and, you know, start gathering that stuff up. And so, I, you know, I just kind of was like, okay, well, let's, you know, I guess I went into, I don't know hospital mode or something i'm not really sure what i i don't know what i was thinking what i was doing i think i was just going on autopilot so to speak and so the police came first you know he came in nice gentleman he's you know he's like what's going on so i, I told him everything i told him you know what was going on i told him how i was feeling what would you know where my mind was and that I want to take the pills. I want to take the pills. I don't, this is not, a. this is, you know, basically I'm, I'm, I want to take the pills and I'm scared because I want to take the pills. That was what was scaring me because 
the 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 desire, the need to take those pills were it was getting stronger. It was starting to, you know, overpower all the other thoughts that I had. And I'm thought I'm thinking if 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 I had my way, really, you would not be here. The coroners would be, but you know, not the paramedics. So he said, okay, you know, hold on. So he went in. He talked to my son. So I don't know what discussions happened between him and my son um but he kept coming in checking on me letting me know it's you know hang in there the paramedics were on their way that you know we were they were going to get me some help so at that set point some point the paramedics showed up i you know gave they asked me basically the same questions i repeated you know what i had told the police they everything i had already told you guys so um at some point because of the way my room is shaped, so you can see my door here. So we're my door, my room is kind of on an angle. So they could not get the gurney around the corner because you know the gurney is long or whatever, and it would not. Anyway, it would not come through the door. So they pulled it in the hallway as much as they possibly could, and so then I had to get out of bed and drag myself over to the gurney. Once again, I'm just in t-shirt, panties, no socks, nothing else, no bra. I'm just, you know, I haven't taken a bath in a week. I haven't wiped myself in three days, two days, however many days. Um, I'm feeling dirty and 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 just just ugh, everything about me just felt horrible and then you know I'm in pain so at that point we got me on the gurney you know took me out in out into the uh, ambulance and so the paramedics the late because they were both women so they both they were saying you know this is what we're going to be doing this is what's happening so they you know they walked me through the little process which i was grateful for um because you know most paramedics don't talk to you they just kind of do what they do and then you know you just lay there <laughs> um so then at some point she says well you realize now that the police put you on a 72 hour hold and I was like I you know I mean I think I kind of knew what that was but I didn't really well no actually she asked me did I know what something was I don't remember exactly what she said but I was like no I'm not aware of that so she said so in essence that is a 72 hour hold which is whatever you know she said the first time um and so I was like whatever at this point I didn't care just stop the pain I don't you can put me on whatever you want to put me on just stop the pain so at this point we get rolling we get to the hospital and <laughs> I am in the triage but I'm in the triage where the drunks <laughs> the uh, people coming down off of whatever drugs they've taken, um, the belligerent, the combative. So now I've never been in this area of the hospital before, so I might be in pain, but I'm like, okay, um, where am I? <laughs> um, so, of course, that quickly became irrelevant because the pain, and I'm like, just please stop the pain. You can, I don't care where you put, you can put me in the garage of the hospital. Just bring some pain meds. So, they could not give me a narcotic, but what they wound up doing was giving me um, a, a liquid ster a steroid in my IV. Um, and when I tell you <sighs> the pain, I could literally feel the pain leaving my body. And it took about maybe... 10 to 15 minutes to really kick in and when I tell you when my body finally stopped hurting it was the biggest relief like oh my god thank you so I was so sleepy I was so tired I was so out of my mind they gave me an Ativan to relax me because by now I'm out of pain so now I'm just hyped up because I've been you know so they gave me an Ativan and I slept and I slept and I slept <laughs> and I slept some more because I hadn't really been able to sleep comfortably since Wednesday. 
of that week. So now it's Saturday the 15th. Um, I'm in the triage part. I mean, you know, the like I said, where the drunks and stuff go part of the hospital. Um, then the next thing I know, she come, the nurse comes over and says, okay, well, we'll be moving you to another area until transportation comes and gets you. And I was like, transportation? So she was like, well, yes, you're going to another hospital. She didn't tell me what hospital or what kind of hospital. So I just said, oh, okay, well, you know, I figured I would, you, I'm not, I'm already in a hospital. I don't know why you're transporting me to another one, but whatever. The pain's gone. Do what you got to do. Um, so needless to say, they did move me. They moved me basically, I guess it's like a, a wait station for when, you know, cause you're, I was triaged. So now I was out of pain and, you know, they had done what they needed to do. So they moved me to like the waiting area. So basically it was just another room. Again, I'm in a room with people who are walking around, you know, belligerent, you know, they're just. They're kind of doing, you know, some are talking to some people we can't see. Um, and so I'm like, okay, well, again, at this point, I'm like, I don't care because they've stopped the pain and I'm sleepy because they've given me the Ativan. So as soon as they moved me onto my bed, I literally just went back to sleep. They woke me up at some point, asked me, was I hungry? I think I ate because I hadn't been eating either because I was in so much pain. I didn't, you know, I didn't want anything to eat. So I ate, um, I think it was like a sandwich and some other stuff. So I ate that and then I laid down and I went back to sleep. Um, so at some point they woke me up and said, you know, my transportation was there and that, you know, I was on my way to the hospital. So once again, I'm loaded onto another gurney, loaded into the back of a mobile transport type thing, um, car or whatever. And then, um, off we go. So, um, so the guy's like, oh, well, you know, you'll love this hospital. It's great. You know, it's newly built, blah, 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 oh, whatever. Just paint, just get rid. So I'm thinking, so at this point now, I'm just like wondering, why am I going to another hospital? I, the pain is, you know, you've gotten rid of the pain, you know, so I'm just, I didn't know what to think. So at some point I'm like, okay, whatever. So we get to the hospital. Um, <laughs> You know, they check me in or whatever. So we get to the room and immediately, immediately, I got into that room and I thought, something's different about this hospital. Um, but I couldn't put my finger on it. So, you know, the, the transportation people and the nurse were talking. So after they exchanged their paperwork and did whatever, so she comes in, she's like, okay, well, we're going to take your vitals and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay. And so she says, now you do understand that you are in the psych part of the hospital. And I was like, the psych part. Um, and you know, not thinking being, I'm sorry, I'm and sorry if this is insensitive, but this is literally, I thought where the crazy people go. And then immediately like, I, I'm like, you know, I didn't mean that. Sorry. I mean, but I mean, thinking psych, you know, they kind of go hand in hand. And so she said, yes, she's like, you are here on a legal hold. And I said, what does that mean? So she said, that means you cannot leave. You are here by court order. <laughs> so I thought, okay um what does that mean she was like that means you are here by you know you're on a legal hold you cannot leave we will you know if you can ask to leave but we will not let you go you have to go before the judge the judge will then determine whether or not you can go home or stay and i thought okay um nobody told me about this part so I just thought, okay, well, um, now what? So she says, well, you can get some rest and, um, your doctor will be in, in the morning and he will, you know, talk, we'll go, you'll go over, you know, the plan basically. So I, she finished, you know, vitals and charting and whatever else. And then she moseyed on out the room. So now I'm looking around and I'm realizing like, this is different. There's no TV. The bed is different. There's no alarms and bells and nurse buttons and, you know, the things that normally come with a regular hospital room. And so I 
once again, I fell asleep because, again, I hadn't slept in, you know, a couple of days. The Ativan was still in, you know, in my system. So it was making me sleepy. So at some point I did doze off. They kept coming in there asking me questions. I really don't remember most of what they did to me during the night because I was just so out of it. So the next morning when I finally woke up, um, they, I, you know, wandered in to the rest of the hospital and I'm looking all around. And so now I'm realizing that the people are up and they're moving about. And, you know, so I'm looking around and I'm trying to see, um, what's going on. So I thought, okay, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore, but the end of the day was I'm glad I stayed. Um, so yes, I was there initially, you know, for the 72 hours, but then the doctor had asked me, did I want to stay voluntarily? And I said, yes. So I agreed to basically another, a week because it was, he wanted to keep me for 10 days because he had started me all on new medication and he wanted to make sure that medica one, the medication was working two that I wasn't having any side, of, side effects and three, that I wasn't, you know, having any more suicidal thoughts. So I had to uh, attend group and I talked to the psychiatrist and, oh, I was also diagnosed as clinical depressed, which probably should, would normally come with, you know, everything that I'm dealing with. I went from healthy to just sick in a span of three years and every year a new diagnosis. So I am on um, an antidepressant, uh, Zoloft. Um, they have me on a low dose of prednisone as well as Celebrex, which keep me pain free. Um, and then a bunch of other meds, you know, vitamins and things of that nature and then high blood pressure, stuff like that. So all I'm going to say is that it, the pain broke me. I have been through so much in my life, but not once did anything break me to this degree. I mean, I've lived in my car for four months. Um, you know, I've had issues with my mom. Um, you know, my family is the epitome of dysfunction. Um, but through none of that, the pain it finally broke me and I just, I couldn't see past the pain. I couldn't see life beyond what I was feeling. Um, so I am grateful for everyone who played a part in this past couple of weeks in my life mainly my son and his girlfriend because they were right there right literally there every you know every step of the way um the doctors at the hospital couple the couple of the ladies that i met that i formed bonds with inside the hospital um it was an experience um i can't or won't say that um it won't happen again because Truthfully, if these medic medications stop working and the pain comes back, I can't tell you that I won't have the same thoughts. Um, you know, suicide and suicide thoughts are quite common. It's not something you talk about. It's not something you want to think about. It's not something you want to believe that will happen to you or someone you know. But surprisingly... One in, let me, I have my notes here. It says one in 5,000 to 15,000 people die by suicide. That's 1.4% of all deaths. So it's more common than you think. Um, and it is in that moment, I can tell you that those thoughts, those feelings, that desire was real. And it, I battled not to not give in to those feelings. Um, 
But like I said, at the end of the day, I never wanted to hurt my grandchildren. I never wanted to hurt my children. I never really wanted to hurt my family. But at the same time, that pain broke me. So, if you or someone you know is having suicidal thoughts, then please reach out. Please reach, talk to someone, call a family member, call the crisis hotline, but do something. Don't allow what you're feeling to determine because you can't take it back. And I think that's what I learned in the hospital. Like, had I done that, there's no coming back from that. Like, you can switch jobs. You can change marriages. You can change where you live. But once you take your life, there's no comeback from that. And at the end of the day, I didn't want to do that to my family. And you shouldn't, you shouldn't want to do that to your family either. People are counting on you. People are depending on you. And like they said, suicide is a selfish act because you don't give the people chance to help you. Um, especially if they don't know that anything is wrong. So I'm going to go ahead now and end this video. Um, I don't know what this my story is going to do. I don't know who it's going to help, but if I help no none other than one person, then I've done my job. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching my channel. And I hope that you continue to stay. I hope that you will continue to come back and watch my videos. So go ahead, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and don't forget to share this video especially if you know someone who is having suicidal thoughts. So I thank you. I thank you. I thank you.